What are some of the strangest things about the Queen Mary, you ask? Well, today I've compiled a list of them for you. These are just some of the curious or odd things about this stately Art Deco ocean liner. The first thing on our list has to do with the ship being made of some rather interesting materials. Sure, she has a steel hull and a steel frame, and her bulkheads are often made with wood and lined with wood veneers. But what if I told you a large amount of the ship is made with asbestos and plastic, and plastic asbestos? Now, I know when you hear the word asbestos, you think of it as a dangerous and toxic material that can cause diseases like mesothelioma. But the thing about asbestos is that if you leave it undisturbed, it's actually a safe material to be around. Asbestos was commonly used in the first half of the 20th century because it had thermal qualities that made it a good insulator, as well as the fact that it was naturally incombustible, which made it perfect for fireproofing materials. Fires on ocean liners were a big thing to worry about. If not managed well, they could quickly spread through the ship thanks to the well-ventilated interiors, and the whole vessel could become a flaming inferno before most of the passengers could escape. Ships like the Queen Mary made things safer with the use of fire doors that closed off sections of the ship to prevent the spread of the flames, as well as the use of overhead fire suppression systems. But with the massive amounts of wood and textiles used on the ship, the designers went a step further by building the bulkheads out of a special asbestos plywood product called Turnall, which was developed specifically for the Queen Mary. This is a product where the layers of the plywood have a layer of asbestos sandwiched in between. From there, the ship's designers could cut thin wood veneers from expensive and exotic wood and then glue those veneers to the Turnall plywood to give the effect of the ship's bulkheads being made of luxurious solid wood panels. And what striking wood grain patterns they were. And if the room should be set on fire, the wooden bulkheads would burn more slowly, or in some cases, not at all, thanks to the asbestos. By the way, Turnall still makes various asbestos products for other countries. I also mentioned that the ship is made of plastic. You see, in the 1930s, plastic was still a relatively new material, and it cost a lot of money to have things made out of plastic, which is why it was considered a luxury material. The most common plastic used in this time was Bakelite, and not only was it used to make decorative objects and trinkets, but women even wore Bakelite plastic as jewelry. And on the Queen Mary, the various fittings like handrails, door handles, cabinet handles, light switches, soap dishes, and yes, even ashtrays were made of a proprietary product, a form of Bakelite known as Roanoid, which was manufactured by Avery Products. What made Bakelite so useful was that it had thermal properties that made it difficult to melt, which was perfect for ashtrays. But due to its thermal properties, Bakelite did not feel cold nor warm to the touch, which is what made it perfect for handles, handrails, and even toilet seats. So what miracle ingredient made Bakelite such a useful product? Why, asbestos, of course. Many different blends, or recipes, if you will, of Bakelite were made with asbestos, and Roanoid Bakelite is found nearly everywhere you look on the ship. And if that wasn't enough, depending on the various colors of Roanoid products, they could also contain lead to help make the colors more vibrant. But before I move on, I must remind everyone that the ship's wall paneling and door handles are all perfectly safe to touch. You could even lick them if you wanted to, though I don't recommend it. But if any of these materials must be cut or drilled into, that is where safety equipment must be worn. Another facet about the ship that you might not have ever thought about was the ship's cats. In the old days, most ocean liners had resident cats aboard to help control the rodent population. But what makes it interesting is that the cats on Queen Mary were registered with the company that operated the ship. The felines were essentially considered employees of the Cunard Steamship Line. Dogs, on the other hand, were not residents on the ship. If you saw a dog, it likely belonged to a passenger. Dogs and other pets were allowed to travel aboard the Queen Mary, though the rules stated that they must be kept in the ship's kennels, which were located up on sports deck, near the first-class tennis court and squash court. Passengers were allowed to visit their pets every day, but the person who took care of the pets, the guy who fed them, walked them, and bathed them, was none other than the ship's butcher. That's right, the butcher, the man who carved up pork, beef, and lamb for the kitchen. 
It was said that a first class passenger could challenge the chef to cook any meal they could think of, and the chef could make it for them. Thankfully though, I've never heard a story where the kitchen crew had to search the dog kennel to satisfy the passenger's hunger. The Queen Mary is home to many bizarre and odd stories of death, but one stands out to me for its strangeness. On the night of September 18, 1949, the captain and the ship's officers were relaxing and thought of making drinks. Captain Andrew McKellar told Officer William Stark to go into the staff captain's cabin to retrieve a bottle of gin. The cabin steward, Frederick Stokes, helped Officer Stark with the search for the gin bottle, which proved difficult to find. Stokes found an old gin bottle and handed it to Officer Stark, who then returned to the captain's cabin and prepared some drinks. Later that night, Stark told the captain that the drinks they had were rather funny. The captain realized that Stark must have grabbed the wrong bottle and instead served up a bottle of carbon tetrachloride, which was used to polish furniture and was being stored in an old gin bottle. The captain had all the men report to the ship's doctor to have their stomach pumped, but Officer Stark did not take it seriously and refused to be treated. Later, he was found unconscious, and when the ship reached Southampton, he was taken to hospital where he died three days after drinking the toxic chemical. I find it rather odd how Officer Stark did not want his stomach pumped, nor did he take the situation seriously. But this story serves as a good reminder to never store toxic or inedible products in food or drink storage containers. It's just not worth it. Hearing about the Queen Mary having a doctor on board may have surprised a few of you. In fact, the Queen Mary had three different areas dedicated to healthcare. Passengers who needed to see the doctor could be admitted to his office on the aft end of B deck on the port side. In fact, the old doctor's consulting offices are still there. They're used as hotel rooms today. If you needed medical care, they would escort you to the ship's hospital, which was located portside on sea deck amidships. There were wards for women and wards for men, nurses stations, a dispensary, and even a surgical theater. There is only one story that I know of where a surgery had to be performed in this hospital, and it was told by former Queen Mary crewman, Ralph Rushton. According to Ralph, he was part of a rescue party that braved the stormy seas by boarding a lifeboat that went to pick up a crewman from a freight ship. The man had a broken leg and needed immediate care, and the Queen Mary was the closest ocean liner with a doctor and hospital. With ocean swells up to 30 feet, the lifeboat made its way back to the Queen Mary where the injured man was hoisted aboard in a specialized basket. It's possible that more surgeries were done here during peacetime, but I don't personally know of any. Most certainly, this hospital would have been busy during World War II when the ship served as a troop transport, and also when the ship was struck by a 92-foot rogue wave that caused her to roll 52 degrees, injuring and killing countless military men and women. However, if there was an issue where one or more passengers had been found with lice, parasites, or communicable diseases, there was a third place aboard the ship to care for them in isolation. This place was rightly called the Isolation Ward. A ship like Queen Mary is a place where several thousand people stay in close contact with others for nearly a week. This kind of environment can cause things to spread rather rapidly. That's why the isolation ward was so important to the Queen Mary. Here we can see the starboard side of the ward where female patients would have slept. They even shared a bathroom and toilet. Next door is a cabin for two female nurses who would tend to the sick female passengers. But the port side of the ward, which today is a large open space as part of the exhibit, used to be a similar room for male patients with an attached cabin for male nurses. I do not know of any instances during peacetime where the isolation ward was used to treat patients, but there were at least two different times where a stowaway was caught aboard the ship and they had to live in the isolation ward until the ship reached port. Why not put them in a cabin, you ask? Well, at the time, all passengers on steamships were subject to health inspection to make sure that communicable diseases and parasites did not cross the Atlantic. Since a stowaway likely did not even attend health inspection, they needed to be isolated from passengers out of an abundance of caution. But there was yet one more use for the isolation ward. Notice the bulkheads are all bare steel. 
This made the hospital a perfect place to put a dangerous passenger. To my knowledge, the Queen Mary never had to carry a dangerous passenger. There is a story told on the ghost tour about a man who murdered his family on the ship and then the man himself was found dismembered after the master at arms locked him in a passenger cabin. But this story isn't exactly true. It took place in England, not the Queen Mary. But hypothetically speaking, the isolation ward could be used to house a passenger that was put there by the master at arms or used to transport a dangerous prisoner across the Atlantic if it was necessary. But again, there are no records that I'm aware of where such a thing occurred. Another oddity about this magnificent vessel is actually a design feature. This is the well deck. A well deck is a recessed deck often found on either the bow or the stern of a ship. In Titanic's case, it had a well deck on both. The purpose of this feature was to break up a wave that might climb over the bow of the ship. RMS Lusitania is an example of a ship that got heavily damaged when a wave came over the bow and slammed into the forward superstructure. To prevent this from happening on the Queen Mary, she was given a well deck designed to force the water away from the superstructure, but the effectiveness of a well deck is arguable, which is why Queen Mary's younger companion liner, Queen Elizabeth, did not have one. In fact, looking back at several Cunard vessels, it appears that Queen Mary is the only Cunard liner to have a well deck, which makes this ship especially unique among her running mates throughout the company's history. The final strange thing I wanted to highlight in this video definitely takes the cake. What if I told you that the Queen Mary offered physical therapies, which today would probably qualify as torture? Well, you see, passenger ships, particularly cruise ships, often have a spa board where people can relax and be pampered. Queen Mary didn't have a spa per se, but she did have something that is somewhat similar. Many ocean liners at the time had Turkish baths. Generally speaking, they offered various therapies such as a swimming bath, a hot room that was also moist, like a sauna, then a dry hot room, and then they had a cold room. Queen Mary's Turkish baths were no different but the Cunard liner boasted the latest therapy trends. If you told the attendant that you were having issues with your shoulder, they would actually take an x-ray photo of your problem area and then prescribe a treatment. The treatment could be something as simple as a massage or ultraviolet irradiation therapy, infrared irradiation therapy, or even diathermy, which is a therapy still used today where high-frequency electromagnetic currents are shot through a specific area of your body to relieve the ache or pain. Today, this type of therapy is regulated and safe forms of it are applied. But back in the 1930s, aboard the Queen Mary, they just cranked up the juice and hoped you felt better when you were done. They even offered a more traditional therapy called an electric bath, where essentially it's like a tanning bed you sit down in a device filled with ordinary light bulbs. The people of the early 20th century believed that the lamps provided some kind of therapeutic quality, although I can imagine the electric bath after a while would start to feel like an electric oven. Here's a bonus fact. Though Queen Mary had hospitals, she did not have a morgue. During peacetime voyages, it was rare but not uncommon for a passenger or crew member to die. Some people died of natural causes, Others died from unsafe conditions aboard the ship due to weather phenomena. In any case, often the body would need to be transported to port, so the body would be stored in the ice cream freezer on D-deck. As a result, all the passengers would be served complimentary ice cream in order to make room in the freezer. The RMS Queen Mary is full of quirks. That's one of the many things I love about this fabulous vessel. There are endless stories and fascinating sights around every corner. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more about the Queen Mary, give this video a like, subscribe to the channel, and write a comment to let me know your thoughts about Queen Mary's strangest things.